Hidden Markov model has been used a lot in bioinformatics applications. Um, so I want to show you a few examples. The first is gene prediction. When the human genome was first sequenced, scientists use Hidden Markov model in order to predict genes in the genome. Um, because from existing knowledge of the genes, they have some idea what genes might look like. They say, well, the gene uh, needs to start from, like usually, well, this is kind of a simple one, but the actual gene model could be more complicated. You might have, for a gene, you have a promoter, and then there's a transcription start site, and then you will start to see exons and introns. Um, so in this case, it, it, this is the in uh, the the uh, yeah. So this is the coding model for the coding region. This is the intergenic region, and this is the uh, stop codon and the start codon uh, in order. So you 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 start from a gene um, in the in the axons. The, you know, start codon have every three amino acid codes for sorry three every three nucleotide code for amino acid and then you might have introns uh, in in the middle and then a, another axon and the an intron and another axon and then it it ends with you know stop codon and also the end of the axon uh, um, untranslated regions and then you go to intergenic regions in the genome and so these are the, the, the hidden states actually a lot more than two because there's promoter, there's axon, there's the first axon and the last axon, there's the middle axons and also there are many many introns and then you have intergenic regions which are in between genes and then at every uh, particular hidden states um, you could say well because promoter we know that there's CPG island maybe there's like a CG, CG rich region and in the codon regions you should not you should not see stop codon until you're at the last axon, otherwise the gene will terminate early. And so you will have the probability of seeing particular uh, nucleotide sequence. And the, the model can be trained with some basic knowledge of existing genes, but then after the genome sequence is, is um, sequenced, you can use that initial estimate to run through against the genome, identify some genes, and then update the parameters again and run it through again, and, and so on, until it converges. Then you will get the parameters for predicting genes, but also annotated genes in the genome. You can use hidden Markov model for protein structure prediction. So here, the hidden states are uh, pro, this, they, these are secondary protein structure prediction. This, the hidden states are the secondary structures that are um, known to represent protein structure, which includes alpha helix, beta sheet, and the coil. So coil are the, you, you can see alpha helix is like this, sheets are like up and down, you know, like a, a strand. And then coil is the spacer connecting them. And so um, there are, you know, usually when you are in a secondary structure, it's, you know, more likely to stay in the same structure, but there is a small probability you will transition to the other two. And at each uh, secondary structure, there is also the probability of emitting different amino acid sequences. For example, prolines are very, it has a very rigid structure, so it's unlikely to really happen in alpha helix. It might happen in beta sheet when the, the sheets turn around, but uh, it doesn't happen in the middle of a, of a sheet um, or beta strand. And coil is much more flexible and, and so on. And so using the hidden Markov model, so the observation you have is a string of amino acid sequence you see on a particular protein. And uh, um, you are trying to train a model uh, in order, including all the parameters, in order to predict on this protein which location is a helix, which location is a beta strand or beta sheet, and which locations are the coils that connects them. Another example for using hidden Markov model is to predict the copy number variations in the genome. Um, you can imagine this as a either sequencing result or um, this is early day, say, microarray result. You hybridize. Uh, in microarray days, you use some reference genome, 
which you know across the genome we should have two co two copies of chromosomes, but you use some you know average uh, genome as your control, and you use another your your this new person's genome as a the, whatever the condition you want to see. You compare their coverage across the genome, or from high throughput sequencing days, you can just imagine you calculate the read coverage across the chromosome of an individual. And you should expect this to be even, and this would be the diploid genome. But in some regions, you might see that suddenly the coverage become much, much lower, and other regions, it's much, much higher. Occasionally, you might see a little noise. This could be you know, sequencing or microarray, the probe is not working, or the sequencing result, that region, you just, uh, just occasional high coverage you may or may not have confidence to call it, but if you have you know, consecutive regions with lower coverage or higher coverage, you might be able to call this as a duplication or deletion in the genome, which has copy number changes. And uh, you can imagine the hidden states are the, the diploid genome, which is probably majority of the region. So that has a very, very strong initial probability and a strong uh, transition probability to stay in the diploid genome, but occasionally you might see a deletion or a duplication. But in this case, you can see there is zero probability to go from a de de deletion directly to a duplication and vice versa. Um, so you, you always go back to diploid before you go to the other brand, the, the other possibility. And uh, the, um, the emission probability is, you know, the probability of seeing this level of read coverage or microarray hybridization signals. Uh, whereas deletion, you can see there's kind of a lower distribution and uh, duplication will be higher. And so you can use this to call the copy number variation regions across the genome of an individual. Uh, the reason we cover this particular lecture now after the hidden mark of, uh, after the uh, histomark chip seek is, Hidden Markov model has been used to annotate uh, regions in the genome. Um, you remember there are different histomarks across the genome. Uh, sorry, the, the, different histomarks like K4 trimethylation. Remember that's kind of a, a promoter mark. Uh, K4 monomethylation, which marks enhancers. K27 acetylation, which marks active genes or active enhancers. Um, there are also K27 trimethylation, which mark repressed regions, K9 trimethylation, which mark repetitive regions in the genome. And so imagine if across the genome, people have done the uh, uh, many, many different, you know, histomark, chip seek. By looking at all the data together, uh, this is a, a work done by Manolis Kalis' lab at MIT. They can divide the genome into many different states. And so some states could be uh, promoters. Some region could be exons. It is like a, it is similar to a, a gene prediction or, or a genome annotation. This region is the enhancer. This is this region is a, a suppressor. That region is the repeat repeat region. That region is exon. That region is a promoter, and, and so on. But instead of using genomic DNA sequence as the input data, it's using all the histomark data across. Uh, so in this study, the discrete time is 200 base pair region in the genome. They, they divided the genome into 200 base pair bins, and at every location, it looks at the uh, histomark signal. You know, what's the, the observation is, uh, what's the K4 trimethylation signal, K27 acetylation signal, what's the K79 uh, methylation signal, K4 uh, monomethylation signal, and so on. And based on all these observations, it makes a best guess that, oh, this region is a promoter. And we know if this is a promoter, then the region next to it is likely to be a, uh, a first exon of a gene. And uh, so there's a transition probability there. The hidden states are the genome annotation or the hidden or the states of the genome. And so a uh, chrome HMM is the method that can uh, predict the chromatin states or chromatin domains based on the histomark data. Another application which you will see in homework four is to predict the chromatin topology. So um, in addition to annotating which region of the genome has promoters and enhancers, um, in the next lecture, you will see that the genome 
very often has these topologically associating domains. And so sometimes within a domain, there are stronger interactions. Uh, this particular region of the genome interact with another region of the genome, even though they are further away, say a uh, uh, 100 kb away there's kind of interactions and so and they, they dictates you know how often things interact with each other and what you would see is um, for example in this region uh, this is one domain and so a lot of interactions uh, happens within here and so if we look at you know this region uh, so there are assays to detect how things interact and so um, this is calculating whether that interaction is biased for one side or the other. If you have even even interaction, so, so this actually is one domain. And at the beginning of the domain, if you look at how things interact, you almost never see this region interacting with the, the domain before, but you see interactions with everything after. So there's like, like a very strong bias towards interaction to things after. But if you reach the middle of this domain, at this point, uh, there is an even chance of in, interacting with both the sequence before and the sequence after, then the signal is kind of even, uh, it's like to, to zero. But then if you keep going in here, these regions have a very strong propensity to interact with within its own domain, which means it's interacting with sequence before, but it doesn't interact with anything afterwards then there is a very strong bias in here as well. Um, so based on the chromatin interaction data, you will see that these type of interaction are suddenly biased towards interaction with things be after or interactions with, thing with sequences before. And we can call these type of boundaries very clearly as a chromatin domain. And you can use this to um, identify uh, chromatin uh, topologically associating domains. And in the next lecture, you, you will learn more about uh, higher order chromatin interaction. And you also use homework four to see how this is really predicted. And so in summary, you can see Markov chain and also especially hidden Markov chain are very, very useful. Um, the, the models in the hidden Markov model includes the observations, which is the coin flip, the hidden states, which are the the co coins that you are using. And there's initial probability, which is the likelihood you, you start with something, the, the, the coin. Transition probability is the likelihood of use, you know, f uh, changing between the coins. And emission probability is the likelihood of seeing the observation using the hidden states, under the hidden states. And there are three problems that uh, uh, we explain the solutions for. The first is, if the hidden Markov model parameters are already given, what is the probability of seeing a, a string of observations? And we can use either forward procedure or the backward procedure, and you should get the same results. The second problem is to infer the hidden states um, knowing the parameters. And for that, um, you know, what's the probability, or, or sorry, what is the state at every location? And you can use either the forward backward algorithm, which uh, can give you a probability prediction at every, every location, uh, but also by Turby algorithm, which will give you the, the best pass that maximize the overall uh, uh, string of observations. The third problem is harder because you only have the observations but the parameter of the, the hidden marker model is not given ahead of time. And we talk about similar to an expectation maximization approach, which is the bomb welsh approach. You randomly start somewhere, uh, maybe use some reasonable, you know, good sense to initialize the parameters. And then you use the parameters to guess the hidden path. And then once you make the hidden path guess, you update your model parameters and you iterate this process until you converge. Um, and uh, hidden Markov model has really been used in bioinformatics a lot. And um, you'll see that in the next lecture as well and in homework four. Okay, that's all for